This industrial site signifies a pivotal moment in history and the birthplace of a revolution. Finding of these space lays the groundwork for the sort of political mobilization that came out of churches and schools. This impressive place was basically reborn out of the ashes of a brutal conflict. And it comes to represent the rebirth of a nation. This commanding complex dates to a time when America was clawing itself back from the horrors of war. William T. Sherman, a prominent Union general during the Civil War, was a renowned military strategist, but he left utter carnage in his wake with his scorched earth policy. General Sherman marches through the South, destroying everything, agricultural buildings, but also the rudiments of industrial buildings that are starting to appear in the South. With its fledgling industry totally crippled, the Southern states knew they had to rebuild. It would see the birth of a new movement with dramatic consequences. So basically, nothing was here before the Civil War or even during the Civil War. Birmingham didn't begin until 1871. And that's when we see the growth of the New South movement, bringing industry to the South so the South never again would have to rely on Northern goods coming down. We can make our own stuff right here in Birmingham. The area around Birmingham offered something incredibly unique, perfect for making iron. The location of this place was just absolutely perfect because of just how cheaply they could make the iron. Within a 30-mile radius, you could get the three components that you need to make iron. So you've got your iron ore, your limestone, and your coal. And it's one of the only places in the world where you can find all three so close together. To exploit it, they first needed a means of transportation. Now, of course, we can make all the iron in the world, but if we couldn't transport that iron, it was useless. And that's where we're right next to this railroad that's behind me. Without railroads, Birmingham never would have been possible. It's the first industrial city built in the United States, not next to a body of water, just because of the railroads. Colonel James Withers Sloss, integral in bringing railroads to the area, didn't stop there. And in 1882, the Sloss furnaces were born. What we're on right now is called a blast furnace. This is really what we use to make the iron. The Sloss Furnace Company quickly became one of the largest pig iron producing companies in the world. The process of making pig iron is both dangerous and complex. The cool thing about this spot is we can see a lot that goes into actually making the iron. It's a lot more than just a blast furnace. Huge towers created hot air that was blasted into the furnace to bring the temperature up to 3,800 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, the water tower is also really important. Without water, we couldn't cool the furnace to help keep it from melting down and make the steam that helped power the site. When in operation, this place would have dominated the skyline. You've got this iron running off and it is glowing, it's so hot. This entire network would be glowing and it doesn't stop. It is going 24 hours a day, seven days a week. To keep this powerhouse running required a huge amount of labor. And one of the buildings provides a clue to the makeup of the workforce. This building is the old black bathhouse. So this is where the black workers would have to shower after their shifts, because of course, this is in the middle of Birmingham, right in the middle of segregation. And Sloss was no different. Sloss could entice workers, black workers, to work for very little pay by providing housing, by providing things that supported communities, churches and other buildings, other community centers, education. And so it could do things that could sort of pull people in to work for them for little pay, again, in a landscape when there aren't many options. A lot of them were either ex-slaves or children of ex-slaves at the very beginning. So being able to provide an education for their, their children was a very, very big part of why they came to live here and why they came to work at a site like this.
over 70% of the workforce was black, primarily based in small cottages in a community that became known as the Sloss Quarters. But like much of America at that time, segregation was heavily enforced. The company operated a strict hierarchy. At the top was an all-white group of managers, chemists, accountants, and engineers. At the bottom, an all-black labor gang. The segregation that's happening at Sloss is part of a larger fabric in which um, so many things are segregated, and you don't necessarily need signs. They're segregated by custom. At Sloss, this played out by having to bathe in separate bathhouses, punch in separate time clocks, and attend separate company picnics. It wasn't just the workplace that was segregated. The whole city was divided, and it was coming to a head. They had this police commissioner, Eugene Bull Connor, who was very, very repressive and was brutal in a city that had a particularly rigid regime of segregation, that had a history of violence, so much so it was known as bombing him. The city was notorious for its discriminatory practices. Yet policies employed by companies like Sloss were having an unintentional effect. By providing schools, churches, houses that are proximate to the facility, that are spaces where African-American people can commune, that's something that is absolutely vital for sort of building up grassroots networks and lays the groundwork for the sort of political mobilization that came out of churches and schools. Finally, in 1963, tensions reached boiling point. Birmingham was about to become the focus of international attention. The mighty Sloss Furnaces overlooks the city of Birmingham, which in 1963 became global news. Martin Luther King went to Birmingham in part because segregation was so rigid there and the city's regime was, was particularly virulent against blacks. So King goes there to draw attention, to also to desegregate the city, and it leads to this children's crusade against um, segregation and racism in the city that um, brings in thousands of children who march and who are then seized upon by dogs and water hoses in a way that is incredibly brutal that brings domestic and international attention. This episode would help bring about desegregation in America. And in theory, at least, that impacted companies just like Sloss. Once the workforce becomes desegregated, everyone has, a, at least on paper, an equal opportunity. African Americans now can apply for higher positions, where before they weren't allowed to. So desegregation was a big part of this, the history of Sloss in that sense. In practice, however, while mid-level roles did open up, black workers were largely restricted to helper roles. And by the time they made major breakthroughs in employment discrimination cases in the 1970s, it was too late. The era of massive plant shutdowns had begun and was already costing them their jobs. New environmental challenges and a turn to plastics spelt the end for this rusting beast in 1971. Today, the furnaces lie abandoned, outdated, and too dangerous to be used. But the towers still stand overlooking Birmingham, a lasting legacy to the people that helped build it. I think the preservation of Sloss is important not only as a record to the way in which the South rebuilt itself after the Civil War, but also it's a really important part of a fabric of not only civil rights history, but the history of black workers in the South. As you approach your typical